Thank you everyone for joining us for today's Transportation U session. Um, just a few general things and then we'll get right to the speaker. So for those of you who don't know, Transportation U, AZ, it's an international group. It's through uh, WTS Women's Transportation Seminar. And the purpose of WTS is to bring attention towards getting more females in the transportation industry. So I've been the chairperson of Transportation U for about five years, and we go to the high school level trying to get more girls involved. Just, you know, we're not forcing you to be a transportation person, but we at least want to make it, you know, give you the opportunity to know what's out there, what possible careers. Um, being in high school, I know even coming out of high school for me, I thought I knew what I was going to do and that changed. But um, at least we're going to try to show you some opportunities throughout the course of the school year. So for as far as Sunny Slope High School, we're, our events are all going to be here. Um, every once in a while we'll have tours where you can go there. You'll just have to get transportation to wherever the tour is. But every month during the school year, we'll have either a speaker or a tour to do. Um, you can stay connected to learn about our upcoming events. If you um, go to Facebook or Instagram and use the keywords Transportation U AZ, that'll show our upcoming events. Um, I am Michael Book. I work for an engineering company called HDR, and I'm not an engineer though. I do community relations. So um, the last 10 years I've been subcontracted out through Valley Metro and working on light rail construction projects. So. My role is basically working with the community adjacent to our construction, making sure the business owners, everyone's, if they have any questions or issues that I help address them. Um, but if you do have any questions about the program, you can always email me. My email address is michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot book, B-O-O-K at H-D-R-I-N-C dot com. Uh, along with me, today's program is supported by Jay Wright, who works for the Maricopa County uh, Department of Transportation and he's a communications officer there as well and upcoming events that we have I know there was a conflict I had something set up for January but I think the girl up program is booked up that month so I'm going to just uh, after the holidays we'll take a break in January and then our next events gonna be February 1st Miranda Sundblom who is also with HDR like me but she's a traffic engineer and then March 1st, we're going to do a tour of my project, the Northwest Extension Phase 2 Light Rail Construction, which is just up the street about a mile. So um, when we get close after the, the new year, I'll start um, having people sign up so we know how many people do that tour. But it should be really cool. We'll have a bus. We'll take you around. We'll show you the active construction. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention that WTS does have a scholarship opportunity. The deadline was December 2nd. It's only for high school seniors, though. So are there any seniors here today? You are? Okay. The pressure's on you. I've got five applications here. If you know anyone who's a senior that might be interested, but basically it's a scholarship for next year going to college, $2,500. Um, if there hasn't been anyone that submitted, then there's a good chance whoever does might have an opportunity. So um, go ahead and take a look at it. And like I said, if there's anyone you know who is a senior or might be interested, then go ahead and take one of those as well. So the deadline has been extended. Um, there is no hard deadline on it, but just uh, reach out to me or fill it out right away. Um, follow the instructions and send it in. But if it's sent in in the next week or two, it should be good. And that's it. So now for today's event, Suzanne Lansford is an electrical engineer registered in Florida and Arizona with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Arizona State University. She is the founder and owner of Town Lighting Engineers, which began in 2006 in Florida as Red Inc providing lighting and signal plans for roadway projects, and occasionally providing engineering support at nuclear power plants. She is also a pilot, a painter, and a violinist. So Suzanne, thanks for presenting Thank today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about how I got from where I started in high school to what I'm doing now. And it has a lot to do with the violin. Um, both of my parents were really super musical. Both of my parents play piano still. My dad paid his college tuition playing piano at a Shakey's Pizza. And uh, my mom was uh, in music uh, in college. She was taking a music performance major in classical piano. And when she and dad started dating, she would play something that she worked all day on 
And, and then he would come home at, at night and having heard what she had been working on, could just play it just by having heard it once because his ear was really that good. And uh, she decided, well, I'm not going to live my life like that. If we're going to get married, then I'm going to do something else. And so she switched to a technical uh, degree. She ended up with a degree in X-ray and radium physics. My dad ended up with a degree in physiology and immunology. And he graduated and got a job at a test lab and got really grossed out. Because at a medical test lab, you deal with everybody's body fluids, especially back then. The standards were a lot looser than they are now. And so he said, enough of this. I'm going to go into real estate. So he got his, his uh, real estate broker's license and uh, real estate license and became a broker and then eventually a general contractor. Um, so it seemed pretty, pretty obvious to me that I was going to go into music because both of my parents are really musical. And so when I was 13, my parents bought me this really wonderful violin, which I still play today. And this violin was made in 1795. Okay, so when, when, was, when, was, when was our independence? It's like, 17 what? 1776? This was made in 1795. It was that long ago. And, uh, and I want to play it for you just a little bit. So we didn't buy it. My parents bought it. And we went to a violin shop. It's not unusual to find violins that are this old. If you go to any really good violin shop, they'll have many because people take care of them. And when, when the guy handed, handed the violin over and they made the transaction and negotiated the price and all that, uh, he said, now listen, Mr. Lansford, I know that you gave me money and I'm giving you this instrument, but I don't want you to consider yourself the owner of this instrument. Um, I want you to consider yourself that you've just bought the opportunity to be the steward of it and to take care of it so that 200 years from now, somebody else can enjoy it the way you're enjoying it now that this instrument is almost 200 years old. So, so I, I, something I take very seriously. I mean, whatever needs to be done, I take it every year for its, its doctor checkup and whatever needs to be done without regard to, to cost, I do it. Um, I'm in a jazz band and I, I still play a lot of music and, and, um, and even back then, when my, with my dad playing jazz, I kind of felt like I wanted to be a musician for my professional career. And uh, and so, and we were in, in the Pacific Northwest, near Portland. And so I was looking at maybe going to Portland State University. I don't know if they had a music program there. Uh, but then something happened. Will it go? Oh, gosh. Somebody help me with this. All right, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And I didn't really find out until a couple of years ago that the reason my parents moved from Portland to Arizona is because of this eruption. It freaked them out. They're like, if I can't even depend on the ground under my feet, I need to be in a different place. So this is a view from Portland. We lived pretty much closer to it. We lived about 40 miles south of the volcano. and. Uh, we didn't hear it erupt because we were south of it and it erupted to the north. And to the north side, they heard it all the way to Vancouver, British Columbia, which is like, well, I'll show you later, like another across the whole state. And uh, when, when this erupted, this is the layer of dust that were on the cars, all the ash, everybody was wearing masks and stuff, just like, just like today, except for the volcanic ash. And uh, you know, you could just like, walk around and it would kick up dust like that. And uh, so they decided they needed to get out of there. So they moved us from there to here. So the, the volcano is around here, uh, around here where we lived. And they heard it all the way up here. We didn't even hear it. We, we got a call from grandma. It's like, oh my gosh, are you guys okay? And, uh, and we're like, what? It was Sunday morning. And what? Uh, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh my gosh, the volcano erupted. Well, up until that point, it was a common thing to do on Sunday to go driving in the mountains and look at the, the steam, the little trail of steam coming from the volcano. And so we knew that it was active and that it was going to go, but we didn't know that it was going to do that. And it just blasted, it just covered ash all over this, this whole area and, and ash went uh, across the United States that way. And so 
And within a few months, they moved us here to Phoenix, and I was at, uh, for a little bit of time, I was at Xavier, which is an all-girls school, and then I ended up graduating from Saguaro. And, um, and the Biltmore Hotel is there, and I got a job there playing violin every weekend, and I played there for two years, and so still, even then, it looked like I was gonna really go, go for music. Um, I had a job at an ice cream store, like a Randy's Sandwiches and Ice Cream, which is still in Scottsdale, and it's just bigger, but it still got pretty much the same menu as when I was working there. I had a job at Marche Gourmet. Like, if any of you guys can get like a food service job in high school, I really totally recommend it. It'll serve you your whole entire life. Uh, um, and then I graduated from Saguaro, and I did pretty well. In fact, I did really good. I was really good at math, and I was really good at science, and um, we didn't have a physics class, but we had a chemistry class, and I was good at that. Um, but I was still thinking about what, what major should I pick? And, and I was thinking, well, I'll just go to ASU and see if I, see if I can join the, um, the music program there. But it was my parents, especially my dad, who was a piano player and then ended up doing something else, who said, well, maybe you already play the violin. You're already working playing the violin. You can already do that. You'll always have that. Why don't you choose something else so that when you graduate with that something else, then you'll have two things. So that if something happens with one, then you can have the other. And so uh, at the time, I thought, well, OK, I like to do everything. I like, I'm, I like, I like math. I like music. I like art. And so at the time, I thought, well, I was reading through the literature at ASU, and I chose a, a major of journalism and, and telecommunications. Because I thought, well, journalism is kind of artsy, telecommunications is kind of technical, and I wanted, I wanted everything. Um, so, um, and I, I did so well in high school, I graduated a semester early, and I went to ASU, and I expected, you know, I, I, I uh, this is my transcript, my actual transcript from my, per, my, my first semester at ASU. And it's not all A's and B's. In fact, look, I have a couple of C's, an A in French, okay? And calculus, the advanced calculus for engineers that I was so proud that I uh, qualified for, I withdrew because I wasn't doing well enough. And then it got worse from there. This is my worst semester. Look, E, E, E. That's three classes I failed. When you get a failure like that, it goes against your GPA. And so that's like three zeros. And can you imagine like three zeros on your GPA? It just like really brought it down. And put me on academic probation. So I was really ashamed and really embarrassed because my whole life up until that, all, all of our failures as kids, my sister and I, whenever something like this happened, it was met with like discipline and shaming and a big argument and a yelling lecture. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my life is over. Um, but when you fail at ASU, what they do is they recognize that as uh, a, like what they say, a cry for help, like a signal like this student needs a little bit of support. This student, like call the student in to the office, find out what their situation is, if there's anything that's actually preventing them from, from, from doing well. Um, provide them with uh, counseling, remind them of the resources that are already there where you know where the, the study opportunities are where the tutors are where your advisors are and just like you know they don't want you to fail they're, they're not looking for opportunities to pick students off and, and eliminate them they're, they want everybody to succeed and so so after a while you know i, I brought my grades up um still took french but i took a lot of a lot of different courses and at the end so this is pretty pretty average for me b's and c's um, but there weren't, there wasn't a lot of focus in my uh, curriculum because I like to do everything. Um, and after my first, my first semester in journalism and telecommunications, I went to see my advisor, and uh, and at, at that point, you know, I was just taking general studies, and and he, w I was young, and I thought, well, I just need better service from my advisor, and he was like, well, if you took this this semester, then next semester, you'll take this this and this, and come and see me next time. And I, I felt like insulted, like. Like, like I, w I want you to care about me. So that's because I was young. I didn't, I didn't understand how to advocate for myself at that time. But I thought, well, that's it. I'm not going to be a journalist or telecommunications specialist. I'm going to do something else. But I don't know what. And, uh, and so it was my mom who said, why don't you go into electrical engineering? You can take your first couple of years to take your general studies. The uh, electrical engineering had the uh, slightly higher entrance standards. And so. When you decide what you want to do, then it'll be easier 
to go into whatever you want to do because you're already in electrical engineering, which is harder to get into than most, most anything. So I did. And um, when I started taking lab classes, like building digital circuits on, on, the, um, on, the, on the boards and, and learning about field and wave electromagnetics and learning about power systems, I just, I just found it all so fascinating, like just so cool. And it was nothing that I had ever been exposed to in my life before. So not only that, it was new. I mean, even the physics class was new. Like when, when we discovered that, that it was possible, like if you have a tank full of water and you have a hole, you know how much is in the tank and there's a hole and you open the hole, there is an actual calculation where you can yeah, tell you exactly where that water is gonna land out the hole if you know everything else. And that, that to me was like magical. So, um, so I, I ended up graduating with a, eh, not a great GPA but it was a degree, and I also afterwards um, took a couple of extra studies um, uh, in mechanical engineering uh, because we were in a project to uh, build a solar car, and uh, we, uh, our, our professor had enrolled us in, a, in the GM Sunrace USA, which is like a solar, po solar car uh, race from, uh, it started out across Australia, but they moved it to uh, a component to universities in the United States. And it went from, uh, I have a slide for this. Yeah, so that's what it looked like. But let me go forward a little bit. This race, we drove that thing from here to there after we designed and built it. And this isn't our actual one. This is the body of the one. I was looking online for for photos because all mine are long gone. And, and I recognize this is the fiberglass um, body that we made, and, but this is not the solar array of my project. And I was a team leader by the time the project uh, was at the end of my year. So I know this wasn't our solar array. We had a different looking one. This was the year after us. And uh, this, this front is, uh, is the Lexan. It just kind of peels back and you hop into the cockpit. And uh, we, it was the first year that our school had done that. And uh, we just barely got the car finished in time to, in fact, we were just not, not even ready in Kissimmee. We were still like finishing the last bit and there were, uh, we had some motor control issues and there were some, some wheel issues and um, they, uh, they let us cart the pieces to the second day to where we finished and then we continued with the race. And so we didn't do well on that year. So there were like 38, uh, 38 cars that were designed by different uh, different teams across the United States, and we came in like 37th out of 38. But we were really happy because there were some teams that didn't finish at all, so we, we considered that for our first year to be uh, a success. And then the year after, uh, they came in halfway through the pack, like 15th or 16th, or what's 17th out of out of 32 or 33 teams, and so. So that was just part of that. But the cool thing about this is way back, this was like in 19, 1989, 1990. Back then, okay, so we were doing solar cars and, uh, and racing them across the United States. And as back then, I really decided that one of these days I want one. And I'm just so pleased that there are so many electric cars <laughs> available right now. And I still don't own one, but, but I will. All right, so that's that. Ah, uh, so when I graduated, before I graduated, so ASU has a lot of counseling available for students. They have job placement. They have a program where you can sign up for interviews and you just show up and do the work and, and they'll just find out what it is that you want to do so that they can help you get to what you want to do. So I went for interviews. My advisors had said, you know, Suzanne, like halfway through my college career, they said, you better specialize in something so that you can be employable. Like if you just take all of these, these random courses, then somebody who's looking for a power engineering specialist, you're not going to appeal to that employer. Or somebody who's looking for a computer programmer, you're not going to uh, appeal to them. Or electronics technician or whatever, because you don't have any, you're just too diverse. But I, I didn't take that advice. And I just kept the diversity in my degree. I got a general electrical engineering degree. And when I went to interview, I got three very interesting offers from three very different companies. Um, Intel was looking for a sales engineer for their computer uh, products, and they were interested in my background because it was diverse. Uh, the Navy wanted me to be a fighter pilot because they wanted to um, 
increase their participation of women back then in, in 1990 in their Air Force. And Sergeant Lundy, which is a nuclear uh, power plant engineering company out of Chicago, uh, was looking for people to uh, support Palo Verde. This is what Palo Verde looks like out there. Every um, nuclear plant needs a big supply of cooling water. And does anybody know where Palo Verde gets its cooling water because there's no lakes or, or rivers or oceans nearby? They get it from the city of Phoenix wastewater. They get it from wastewater. So that, I think that's awesome. But all, of, all up to that point, you know, nobody told me, or maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I don't remember anybody here saying anything about a professional registration or an engineering intern exam. Uh, what, what is normal is that if you want to be a professional engineer, which you need to do if you, if you have your own uh, company or if you do any kind of engineering and there's a bunch of exceptions, like if you're working under another professional engineer, um, then you need to uh, go through a process where you take a general exam in your, in your discipline. So I would take the electrical or engineering EIT, um, which is a lot of math and basic. Uh, it's almost like a, a summary of the college courses that I had just taken. So had I taken that then, it would have been a lot easier than when I eventually did take it, which was four years later. Uh, but it was my company who advised me, it's like, hey, are you interested in professional registration? Because we're interested in you being professionally registered, so why don't you take the EIT? And so I did that, and I passed it. And so the process after that is, um, after you get the EIT exam, if you pass it, four years of experience, and I think the rules on that are changing. Um, after your degree, four years of experience, um, under a registered professional engineer, then you can apply for your PE exam. Here's the Arizona, the AZBTR website. That's where you go to find out about all that. And they, they talk about all of the requirements to, to register for the EIT and for, and, and for the PE exam. The exam was a whole day, oh my gosh. So, we moved from there to there, and the, I got my EIT, the contract at Palo Verde uh, ran out, and they said, we're sorry, we can't support you anymore here, but our home office is in Chicago. We got tons of work there. If you're willing to relocate, we'll relocate you, and you can go there. So I did, I went to Chicago. And I went there on like January something, January, it was snowy, and I looked, <laughs> and I looked out the window of the airplane, and I'm like, gosh, look at all those salt flats. I didn't know there were so many salt flats, and the lady next to me was like, you're an idiot. It's snow, it's snow down there. Ugh. Anyway. So I went to Chicago, and uh, what, what I was doing with uh, nuclear plant support is uh, Palo Verde at the, at the time, in fact, all nuclear plants at the time were doing all of their documentation and all their work. They had some computers, but most of all of the documentation was in paper binders, three ring binders that were kept updated in controlled locked areas. And this Palo Verde was one of the first plants to go with a computer database ahead of SIMS, which is uh, their station information management database. And right out of college, my first job was, I remember this interview that I had with this company, made it through the first couple of rounds and I got to the point to where they were dis uh, discussing the specifics of the jobs that they had available. And uh, the guy who ended up being my boss said, uh, okay, so we want to populate this database. This database has every part, every component, every piece of equipment and a whole plant in it and listed by its location and its use and its safety classification. And, but we need to populate this database like if it's a thread, we need to know what ASTM grade steel it is and we need to know how many threads per inch and how, what the strength is and what it's qualified for and what its documentation is. For every nut and bolt, every relay, every gasket, every rubber band, every, everything in the whole plant. He says, how does this sound to you? And I said, because I was kind of a smarty pants then like I am now, I, I said, sounds tedious. And he laughed. And he says, you're the first person today to tell me the truth. <laughs> he says, because it, it is tedious, he says, but we think this is a really great opportunity and a really great opportunity to, um, um, to, to know a lot about a lot, like know your terminology about plant parts and plant systems so that that will provide you a foundation to move on. And that's what it did. So I took that job in Palo Verde, moved to Chicago, and Chicago has a bunch of nuclear plants around it. 
Check this out. Here's Palo Verde. Here's San Onofre. This is one in Washington State. So there's all of these around Chicago. And we ended up doing, I mean, there's, there's Wisconsin Electric. There's a, a Manitowoc. There's a power plant up there that I help support. There's Byron and Braidwood and Dresden, the South Falls cities. I spent a, a, a summer at, in New Jersey at Salem and Hill Creek and uh, started getting specialized in uh, equipment qualification and data management. Equipment qualification is like in a nuclear plant, there's really important safety rules. And uh, uh, one of them is like you, if a function is really important, there, there has to be redundant ways to get it done and they can't affect each other. And, uh, and the other one is whatever is required to shut down the plant, any equipment, any computer system, anything, not only has to be a part of uh, that redundancy system, but it has to be qualified to shut down the plant even if there's a disaster in the room where it's housed. So it either has to be shielded or it has to have really good gaskets or it has to be like extra strong or, or not in the room where the accident could happen. So there's all kinds of accident analysis that happens for our nuclear plants. And my specialty ended up being <laughs> uh, aging analysis of the, the polymers, which is like rubber gaskets and things, and insulators in electrical equipment. And so even though my degree was electrical engineering and my EIT was electrical, that was kind of a lot of um, like chemical engineering, like uh, material degradation equations. And so you had to like predict how long this rubber seal was going to last, um, even if it was at the end of its, of its qualified life, it still had to be able to shut down the plant safely. And so I became kind of like a, a narrow niche specialist in this EQ, they call it EQ equipment qualification. And, uh, and I was pretty happy there. And, and so my boss was happy, everybody was happy. I was in Chicago, everything was happy. And I, was, I had my violin, I was playing in jazz clubs every once in a while, and it was really cool. And, uh, and my boss came to me one day and he said, um, we're really happy with you, and we hope that you're really happy with us. Um, just FYI, if it is your, ten your intention, and we, we dearly hope that it is, to stay at this company for your career, um, maybe you would consider, consider partnership, being a partner in Sardar de Lundi. And if you would consider that, just so you know, most of our partners have the professional engineering registration. Not all of them, but most of them do. Just a little, like, just a little nudge, like you, if you wanted to consider your PE exam and, and getting your professional registration, we would definitely support you with that. And so I thought, well, that's great. But all of these field assignments were horrendous. I mean, uh, there was a project, this one is like two or three hours each way from Chicago where I lived, and they didn't have, the contract didn't have any accommodation for any per diem or expenses or travel. And so I was either <laughs> driving, driving each way or, uh, or staying there at my own expense. Um, that wasn't normal. Normally all of our expenses were covered. But there were a lot of, like even these, uh, these nuclear plants out here were like a couple hours each way drive. And uh, I had colleagues who had signed up for the PE exam and they were driving and they didn't have time. You know, we were working sometimes some projects are so critical that we were working 60 or more hours a week, sometimes 80 or more. I remember doing a 24-hour shift a couple of times because you know, when a nuclear plant is shut down, at the time they were losing a million dollars a day, and, and the, the, the longer that they lose a million dollars a day, the worse it is for everybody. And so, um, so they want you to just work as hard as you can to get it done. And so I was keeping those kinds of schedules, and I thought, well, it's been, it's been a lot of years since, since I took this material that I'm going to be tested on for the PE, so I need some kind of accommodation uh, to study. Because my friends were taking the exam and, and failing because they just didn't have time to study. And, and, uh, and it was, it's expensive. It's a long application process to take the PE. It's like pages and pages of stuff. And you have to have your authorized transcripts from your university. And you have to submit um, references from the people that you know that you've worked with to prove that you have worked under the guidance of a registered professional engineer. And I thought, well, I'm not going through all that um, and just to fail, like my colleagues. Um, so I asked for an accommodation. And I said, I need, I need something. I need, you know, my boss, Randy, 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 my boss, my boss, 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 boss Randy, Randy, Randy had, uh, had encouraged me to take this exam. I need extra time to study. 
I need either a local assignment in Chicago, because I live in Chicago, I could walk to work to the office there, or I need, uh, uh, give me some uh, unpaid lead, like a, a month of unpaid lead so I could study full time, or just, just any, kind of, any kind of accommodation like that. And uh, my immediate supervisor at the time um, wasn't really keen. I mean, he, he was not, not really uh, an advocate for me. And uh, I was not much of an advocate for myself either. So he was uh, kind of uh, gave non-committal commitments, like, well, I'll see what I can do. I understand you need that. I'll just see what I can do. And I thought, oh, time is getting of the essence. I just can't do this. Had I been then the person that I am now, I would have gone back to my boss's boss, boss, and I would have said, you know, appeal to him for this accommodation. But my boss wasn't giving it to me. Time ran out, and and so I quit so that I could study full time. And I thought, well, I can I can always go back after I get my PE. So I quit Chicago, and I moved to Florida because I knew friends there, and they had a place for me to stay where I could study full time, and I traded. Uh, I traded rent for doing some 3D, uh, 3D modeling for a tower company who, that had uh, some like uh, cell towers, and they all have this uh, um, um, equipment, brackets, screws, all thread, nuts, bolts, uh, for special antennas, different kinds of antennas. And so I traded work for the, to stay at this guy's lake house and uh, studied and passed that thing, and it was a 23% pass rate for the test that I took. So not only was I starting from behind, but I'm just super proud. I took a, a course at the, at the University of Central Florida for PE preparation, and I used that to schedule my time because every week they would meet and go over different, uh, different topics, like uh, now we're gonna go over electrical circuits, and now we're gonna go over um, the electric code calculations, and now we're gonna go over some mathematical part. And I used that to uh, schedule my study. And you know what? Uh, I was scared because in my schedule, I, uh, it took me half the time I had to get over just the most basic stuff that I had to cover. It took me half the time I had to get over, like, to get through the first 10%. And I thought, that's, that's not enough time. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to fail this thing. And I, I quit my job in Chicago. <laughs> like, and, uh, but it worked out okay once I got over that uh, uh, inertia to study for the PE and to get get things rolling, get my mind back into the exam mode instead of the the production mode, and I passed it, and it was awesome, awesome, awesome feeling. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it, and I had quit Sergeant of Lundy, and I was in Florida, and there was a there is a nuclear plant there in Florida, but I was just kind of tired of that, and so I opened the newspaper in the small town where I lived, and it was like. Oh, there's a civil engineering firm in town that is looking for a civil engineer. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go over there and just see. I'm going to talk to them. I called them and I told them my story about, about nuclear engineering. And the guy on the phone kind of laughed at me. It's like, thank you for calling us. We do need help, but if we are ever looking for an electrical engineer with a specialty in nuclear EQ, we will definitely call you. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> and I said, but look, I can do CAD. I can do calculations, I can do technical reports, I can help your customers understand what, why they're paying $10,000 for a couple of pages of output. Like, I can, I, can, I can do all that. So if you need anybody to do all that, I can help you. And they're like, yeah, actually we do need some people to do that. So they hired me as a civil engineer with no civil engineering experience because I can do a lot of different things that they needed. And so uh, I think the first thing I did was a parking lot layout. The guy there was uh, trying to show me how to do that. I already knew CAD, so uh, parking lot layout. We ended up doing some horizontal control and vertical control. Um, I did a drainage project. They put me to manage a roadway project that was uh, um, demolition and reconstruction of a road that was just two lanes and swale drainage to a uh, two-lane divided landscape fully median um, a boulevard with curb and gutter drainage, which is a whole, a whole other thing. I knew nothing about it, which was a good thing because I could go there and the, plan, the plans were supposed to have been 90% by the time I got them and I got them and I did not know what I was looking at. I was looking at these roadway cross sections and they didn't make any sense to me. You have to do anything? No. Okay. 
they didn't make any sense to me. So, so I would go to the person who was responsible for that component and like, hey, um, this is the this is the cut and fill cross section, and it's supposed to calculate how much how much dirt per I don't know ten feet along the whole uh, length of the roadway that you're supposed to um, remove, and how much you're supposed to put back to make the the roadway profile that you want. And so I'd ask questions like I just done like I just don't understand. Explain to me what what this is here so that we can say that it's okay. Um, and most of the time. Coming back there with very simple questions would lead to big changes because what would happen is the guy who was in charge of that section, he would say, oh, so-and-so other person told me that was done. <laughs> and so, um, so we, got that, we got that job done. That was Burns Road. And it's still, still awesome. And one of the things that happened on Burns Road was that, so we had the ribbon cutting and then they had this huge rainstorm. Huge rainstorm. It was like a few inches. It happens a lot in Florida, but this ribbon cutting had just happened. And at one end, water started building up, drainage wasn't happening. And everyone called me, it's like, Suzanne, <laughs> your, your road is filling up with water. Well, why did you, we don't whatever. But I had a gig that night and I had to play violin somewhere so I couldn't go out there and help them direct, direct traffic, which was probably not the best decision, but um, there were lots of other people to help. And what had happened was during construction, um, they, uh, they had put a concrete plug in one of the main bay pipes so that they could do some work at the dry and had not removed that and they had this flooding rain so they sent someone down there to knock it out and then everything just drained in just just 10 minutes and so that was scary but that was cool so I was working as a civil engineer there and we had plans on the table and it was a subdivision and my boss there John he said hey red you call me red because my hair's red I said hey red uh, you're electrical, right? You have an electrical engineering degree? And I said, yeah, I'm PE. And he's like, well, why don't you throw some lights out there? I'm like, throw lights out there. That's a whole thing. That's a whole specialty. You can't just throw lights out there. Like in his mind, he was like, take a light sticker and then just put it there so that it looks like basically evenly distributed. And, uh, and I said, well, I don't know anything about lighting, but I'll learn about it. And so I took a course. Uh, it was like a three or four day course with uh, from the University of Wisconsin on effective roadway lighting. And up to that, the point I took the course, I had, take, I had researched a lot. I had talked to vendors and I had done, done research and studied and, um, and used that course to basically confirm that what I, what I thought was basically supposed to be the scope of my work as a lighting engineer was tweaked to be correct. So I learned about that. And then, and then John says, hey, Red, why don't you, <laughs> Why don't you um, throw some signals out there? I'm like, signals? Oh my god, that's even more complex than lighting. So I took some signal courses and learned about uh, signals and lighting, and I became the one person at that civil engineering firm that was doing traffic signals and roadway lighting for most of the projects that they were doing at the time, which is really cool, because I like to be the person doing the thing, you know? And uh, that was, uh, the company was LBFH, and they were bought by Boyle Engineering that was eventually bought by AECOM, and uh, even with AECOM, uh, AECOM doesn't need signal, I mean, signal and lighting subcontractors. They have a whole transportation department with signal and lighting engineers that can do their own. But since we had that really good working, functioning relationship, I ended up doing a lot of work um, for AECOM. But it was really hard for me uh, before AECOM came on to get resources from that company because I was the only person doing lighting and signals. So when I'd ask for a book or a course or I needed to take a course and so I needed to take two days off they would they would say well nobody else is doing that so I can't approve that right now otherwise everybody will want that I'm like well I'm the only person so it was really frustrating and, and so then I'd say well then give me two vacation days and I'll go and take the thing myself and and they said okay well we can't have that so all right you can have those two days back and it was really awkward We're doing that negotiation all the time so I met with my boss at the time better advocate now and I said I have an idea why don't I quit? Love you guys, but why don't I quit and work as an independent contractor providing you with these traffic signal and lighting plans so that you don't have to manage any of my work. You just send me the base file in CAD for the civil engineering and I will, I will do the lighting design. I'll sign and seal it and I'll give it back to you and I'll send you an invoice. How does that sound? And you're like, oh God, that sounds great. 
to not have to manage you anymore. And so I, I separated from the company, became an independent contractor, just Suzanne Lansford, just m myself, uh, doing traffic and signal lighting plans as a subcontractor to, I think at the time it was Boyle Engineering. And, and that, that was working out great for a while and we were um, applying for, you know, writing proposals for bigger and bigger projects. And uh, there was a project that, uh, that was a design build for five intersections uh, signalization in Martin County, and it was post-hurricane recovery. Florida gets a lot of hurricanes, and so they have a lot of traffic signal and lighting damage after hurricanes. And, um, and it, it required federal funding. And whenever you have federal funding, it's a whole another mountain of paperwork on top of all the work that you're already doing to get the permit and design done. So the contractor that I had a great relationship with, the Signal Group, um, said, Suzanne, we really, we really need you to, uh, we want to go with you on this proposal, but you have to be registered as a disadvantaged business. <laughs> What's a disadvantaged business? They're like, well, it's a program with the state of Florida where like women-owned and minority-owned businesses um, have a certain accommodation in the evaluation of proposals. They have like, they get like five more points or 7% more points. And I said, well, I'm not disadvantaged. Like, why, why would we do that? He says, if you don't get that certification, we need to go with a company that is certified as a disadvantaged business because we want that extra 7% um, that counts in the proposal. I said, okay, I'm disadvantaged, you know, I'm gonna go. And, and what you do is you um, fill out uh, your, your ID and, uh, what, what kind of minority you are. In, in my case, it, it's like I'm a female, so that's my minority status. And also, I'm a small business because it was just me, so like every criteria of small business, I fit that because it's, I, I couldn't make a million dollars a year myself. I probably could now, but not then. And, and so I got the, uh, uh, the certification, what do they call it? DBE. DBE, WBE, Women Owned Business Enterprise, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. You hear these acronyms, WBE, DBE, <laughs> and uh, SBSB. And so I got that certification, and that contract required errors and emissions liability insurance. A whole other thing for me. It's like, what? Errors and emissions liability insurance. Started getting quotes for that, and the quotes were astronomical. They were like uh, 20 or 30 percent of what I was going to gross. And the agent I was working with said, well, if you were a corporation, then it would be a lot less. I mean, and I said, you mean for the same amount of work, it's less money if I'm a corporation to pay for the insurance, uh, the cost of insurance premiums, than if I'm an individual? So he says, yeah. And I said, well, now I'm a corporation. And so uh, I think I went to LegalZoom.com and I just, I just filled out the stuff and had LegalZoom uh, uh, do a, a corporate entity registration in the state of Florida. And uh, I got my liability insurance. We submitted the proposal. We got the proposal after all that. And, uh, and I named the company Red Ink because, a couple of names, because my boss would call me Red. And then I didn't want him to say like, well, who is this spectacular engineering company? You know, I wanted Red to do it. And it's like, he can always say, get Red to do the proposal. Get Red to do, <laughs> do the lighting plan. And, and also I was, had a big QAQC component uh, there for the plans that they were producing and, and I used Red Ink, so Red Ink was a double, a double whammy uh, name. So, also in Florida, Florida has a particular problem that I ran up against and it has to do with um, the kind of light. Yay! It's my turtle neck. So these are sea turtles. What happens is mother sea turtles, change the subject, Mother sea turtles come in the, during a certain part of the year, uh, during the summer, and they lay eggs, they bury their eggs in the sand, about 100 eggs on average, 75 to 100, and then they leave. And then several weeks later, these guys hatch all on their own. You could, you could tell when they start to hatch because the mound that was their nest, it starts to sink as the eggs start to open up inside, and they come out, and then they find their way to the ocean. And not very many of them actually make it because, you know, if they're, if they're, they are such great snacks to every predator out there. Seagulls eat them, every fish 
that it's out there eats them. So that it's really in their best interest to get to the ocean as expediently as they can. And this problem, well, this problem, I can describe the problem in a minute. Um, turtles nest everywhere from the Gulf of you know Mexico down to Texas all the way, all the way up to you know Cape Hatteras in New Jersey. And the federal government uh, has authority to, and and gives authority to all the states, to uh, under the Department of Environmental Protection, the states can do whatever is necessary to protect the species that are on a protected endangered species list, and these turtles are one of the species on the list. And so every state has um, pretty much the same mitigation strategies, and that is that you have to have, first of all, you can't, you can't bother them. You can't touch them, you can't pick them up. Um, and most of them hatch at night, although these hatched in the day. And when they hatch at night, they make their way to the sea, however they do it. They just, they smell it, they see it, they feel it. But if there is a light anywhere behind them, they'll get distracted by that. And they're like, hey, light over there. And they'll go toward that light. And so if there's a lot of artificial light, these guys will get distracted and they will, they will go away from the sea and they'll just die wherever they end up on land. And so um, being really sensitive to light, um, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commissions who, who manage the permits for lighting on transportation projects all along these Gulf Coast areas have said, you must use this color lighting uh, because the sea turtles are not as distracted by this color light. And there's a bunch of other strategies too. And uh, that it's, a, it's, it's not a very good visibility light. It really does look like that. And, uh, and so at the time, uh, the Department of Transportation and and the Fish and Wildlife were not working with each other at all. In fact, the DOT had their illumination standards and the Fish and Wildlife had their standards. Fish and Wildlife were supported by the power of the federal government and the Department of Transportation just said, you know, whatever, whatever they say, you just do it. And I said, but it doesn't meet the lighting standards and we can't get the equipment back there. That was in 1990, uh, 2000, 2005, 2006. This is more recent, but back then there were no like LED products were not up to snuff. They were using low pressure sodium, which is just terrible, terrible light. And it's about that color and it's a huge fixture and it's unwieldy, it's ugly. And so they're like, there's, there's really no good solution. And, and, uh, but they still required the PE, that's me with my license to sign off on the lighting plan. And I said, well, but my, but wait, my signature says that I agree that the, um, the lighting plan um, substantially conforms to the plans and, pre uh, plans and specifications that we submitted. And if we do that, which was a modification that the Fish and Wildlife requested after we had the set of approved plans, I said, I can't, I can't sign and seal it. He says, well, I need to be signed, uh, I mean, certified. I said, well, I can't certify it. He's like, well, just certify that you looked at it. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is a big problem. I mean, problem bigger than just this one project, that problem exists on all those areas. And so at the time uh, I went out and did some measurements, they were not great. And when I signed it, I just said, I signed it and these are the measurements. And that's what I signed. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say that they were designed according to the DOT specs like, like would have been great, but it just wasn't possible. And, uh, and the, and the, the the state DOT was okay with that. So obviously that's not a great solution, uh, but that's not the end of the story. Let's see, what do we have next? Oh yeah, so my mom had a surgery in 2011. She had her entire spine reconstructed and it involved an incision from here all the way up to here. She had scoliosis, she had a deformation, she needed some help. So I moved here to help her get over that. And I left all my people in Florida, which was really sad. Came back here, which was really great because I love Phoenix. I love the desert and I feel like home here. You know, I graduated, graduated from ASU and, and uh, got mom through her surgery. You know, when somebody has a, has a crooked spine and then they get it straightened, she was two inches taller after the surgery from before surgery, which is something that she likes to tell everybody. And so, so I was here, uh, and right away, after I've been doing all this lighting and traffic signal and transportation work in Florida, 
um, got here, and my nuclear industry friend was like, hey, Suzanne, I heard that you might be available. So I was, and so I did a little bit more nuclear plant work, and then I thought, wait, 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 I remember quitting this before. I want to live where I live and work where I work, and um, so I got a dog and I planted a garden and <laughs> decided to, uh, to do some lighting and, uh, and signal work here. And I did a little bit, but you know what? That problem in Florida is a persistent problem in Florida that doesn't really exist as much over here. And it's still a big pain in Florida. And I have experience there. And so I kept getting calls from Florida. It's like, Suzanne, can you work on this turtle project here and there? And so, um, so I still have work in Florida and some work here. I have some projects in Scottsdale and Mesa and, and, uh, oh yeah, we talked about light color, but I'm running out of time. Flagstaff has a Lowell Observatory. Lowell, Lowell Observatory has the same lighting restrictions as turtles. Why would that be? Why would... Because if you have a lot of bright lights up by an observatory where they're looking at night and you have all this white sky glow in the sky and they're trying to take astronomical photographs and measurements, it's all that scattered. And if there is, if the light, if they limit their street lights to like one very limited bandwidth, then uh, then the observatory can filter out that bandwidth and they can get a really clean image. And so um, to that extent, uh, the, the turtle lighting uh, situation really does, does exist in Florida. Uh, oh yeah, haha. <laughs> I still play in a band. This is my trio, where we three this piano player, if you ever, if you love piano, look up Nicole Pesci. She is an insane alien from outer space. Great. The singer's pretty good. I'm not terrible. But this piano player is awesome. I paint. COVID, I stayed home and painted. My stuff is up online. And my website is really weird because it says nuclear plant engineering support, traffic signal design, outdoor lighting. So I figure one of these days when I decide what I really want to do, um, I, will, I will focus a little bit more one of the things that was made available and is available to every small business in Arizona is that uh, Arizona Department of Transportation uh, offers a small business workshop, I forget the name for it, but it's about 20 weeks every week, several hours every week, of uh, business related training. And I took that course because I wanted to figure out how ADOT does its work. and um, And so and, and, and one of the things that they recommended was that, you know, they have a marketing specialist come in and talk about your online presence and your social media and all that. And one of the things that they said was, you know, if you have not started a company yet, and I thought, oh, no problem, I've started a company already. They said, well, if you haven't started a company yet and you're looking for a corporate name, it would be great if it could describe what you do somehow intuitively so that you don't, so that they know. And I thought, well, Red Ink has really been kind of problematic because um, in accounting, red ink is a financial loss, and so there's that implication. Um, there was a, uh, a red ink uh, independent film that was a horror film, so that the first few years when I, when I uh, looked up red ink, I, I get these horror images. And, um, and then, you know, the personal reasons that I had, you know, my boss would call me red, they, were, they just weren't serving it. So I thought, well, I'm going to change my name to Town Lighting Engineers because back uh, in the 90s, I had bought townlighting.com, and so that's what I use right now, Town Lighting Engineers. And that's how I got from there to here today. Still play the violin, still paint, I still use my PE. That's it. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and for Thank everyone you. for being here. Thank you. Thank you.